All right, two random questions. Two random questions are, um, are how do chemists get involved with uh, you know trying to work against climate change? Um, I thought this was a good question, especially considering that the earliest um, the earliest published evidence that anthropogenic climate change was real was actually published by a chemist, Svante Arrhenius, the guy who defined um, the Arrhenius acid. So one of the earliest definitions of what an acid and what a base were um, was also the first person to publish evidence suggesting that the Industrial Revolution was causing climate change. Um, this was back about 1880, um, so quite a long time ago. So chemists have actually been working, working on um, communicating and uh, working to mitigate the effects of climate change a lot of different ways. Um, the problem is, is that lots of chemists also um, like to make money because they're humans, just like all humans. There's humans that um, that will ignore future consequences to make money now in every field, and chemists are no different. Um, and that's why it's still probably still to this day, the largest employer of chemical engineers is still big oil companies. Um, they're trying a lot of the, a lot of the uh, chemists and chemical engineers working for big oil companies are still trying to get them to transition towards more renewable energy sources. Um, but that's an uphill battle because they're still making money off of oil. So why would they change? They're, they're simultaneously conducting research on what the next wave is going to be of transportation and, and energy. Um, but as long as they're still making money selling oil, they're still going to sell oil. Um, so there's, you know, like every field, there's chemists that have have uh, the right idea. And, or I guess I shouldn't I should impose value judgments on that. There's chemists working to mitigate climate change and there's chemists that are less concerned and more out for themselves, just like in any field. Um, and then this other question was, how exactly do people discover this stuff anyway? It doesn't really matter what this is referring to. Um, this stuff is anything. Um, basically, it all comes back to that, is it a Newton quote or an Einstein quote? It's the, if I've seen further, it's because I stand on the shoulders of giants. Um, basically, research builds on itself, right? When you do research, you get to the edge of the known universe, so to speak, in terms of knowledge, in terms of understanding, and then you just push a little bit further. So it's not like the, some, there are some scientists who do great, great, immense things that discover an entire field of study, but for most working scientists are discovering one tiny little thing at a time. Um, when I was in grad school, there was there's a certain chemical reaction um, that was not very well under very very useful used all over the place called the Click reaction, um, and it was not very well understood at a theoretical level. It's very very niche application. It was used in a bunch of different areas, but they didn't really care about how it happened. And all the papers that had ever been published on the actual mechanism of it were done wrong. Um, and my research was figuring out that they had done it wrong. And so there was a brief period of time when I was in grad school where I knew more about one chemical reaction than literally anybody else on the planet. It's a very, very tiny niche subject. Um, and so it's not something most people are interested in, but that's, that's how science is done. Millions, hundreds of millions of people, probably not hundreds of millions, yeah, probably hundreds of millions of people working one tiny bit at a time on their tiny little part of science. And that expands the entire breadth of human knowledge. Big, big advances happen when somebody's able to take this little piece of knowledge over here and this little piece of knowledge over there and explain why they both happen using some shared information or some shared concept that works in both areas at once. Um, but it doesn't all, it's not always apparent until several decades later whether that was a big deal or not which is why usually for a Nobel Prize, it usually takes several decades before you actually get recognized for the research that you did, um, which is unfortunate in the case of Rosalind Franklin, because even if she'd been given credit, she was dead before Watson and Crick got their uh, Nobel Prize for discovering the structure of DNA, and they don't give posthumous Nobel Prizes. Um, so even if they wanted to make it right, they can't at this point, according to their own rules. 
course, that is their own rules. They could change those rules if they wanted to. But anyway, that's getting off topic a little bit. Um, but yeah, basically, you become an expert in one tiny area. In that one tiny area, and then you contribute one tiny thing to one tiny area. And that's how science goes on. Um, I've heard, heard it described as if you, if you take the sum of human knowledge, these are attached to each other, and represent the sum of human knowledge as a, as a circle, um, your job, at this say right here in the middle is zero knowledge on anything. Becoming an expert in the field is making it to the edge of the circle. Conducting research is adding a tiny little bit to that circle. So they call that, they call that your dissertation temple. You added one tiny little pimple to human knowledge. Um, that tiny little bit might turn out to be important in the future. It might not, but it's still contributing to the sum of human knowledge, which is cool. And it's also cool to think about that there is a, if you go into grad school and do research, there is one particular topic you know better than anyone else in the world, literally. That's kind of, that's kind of fun. So it has to do with orbitals. Should I keep going? Or just, there's a class of reactions. These click reactions were this molecule here, this group here is called an azide. And it would react with an alkyne, which is a carbon triple bonded to another carbon. Um, and when they react, you break one of these pi bonds and one of these pi bonds, you make two new bonds here. Actually, there's still another pi bond there. Um, and in order to do that, though, you have to break and form two bonds simultaneously, which means that you have actually four orbitals in play at the same time. Most organic chemistry reactions are one orbital breaking and one orbital forming at the same time. Because it's two orbitals breaking and two orbitals forming at the same time, it gives it what's called multi-reference character, which means all the standard computational methods don't work. They don't give you the right answer because they ignore the fact that it's two bonds forming and two bonds breaking at the same time. And most of the experimental chemists who or were trying to explain this process using computational methods didn't understand multi-reference character or even the own the method that they were using, they would just plug in a number or plug in some structures and get a number out and call that good. Um, so because they didn't understand the theory behind the calculation, they were doing the calculation wrong, but still getting an answer. Uh, it just didn't match with reality. Their answer didn't work and they couldn't explain why. And it was because multi-reference character methods are really, really hard to implement and were sort of cutting edge at the time. And so there wasn't a whole lot of people on the world in the world who knew how to use them um, or when it was appropriate to use them. So that's more than I was planning on going into on that detail. But that wound up being a really important reaction because it gets used to do things like you can link green fluorescent protein to an existing protein, and then you can kind of tag a specific molecule within a cell. Um, and actually track what organelles that enzyme is going to. So it's got, it was actually really important in biochemistry and figuring in molecular biology, figuring out where specific molecules wound up being used. Um, so it, it had lots of actual physical application, but they didn't understand the mechanism very well. Anyway, here's what we covered last time. This is that summary slide that we ended with, different types of radioactivity. Um, we covered alpha particles. An alpha particle is just a helium nucleus, right? It's two protons, two neutrons flying out of a parent molecule. Um, and I guess the, um, the other term, I don't think I used this before, is the parent nuclei versus the daughter nuclei. Parent nuclei is basically just the another way of saying reactant. The reactant in a nuclear react, in a uh, radioactive reaction or nuclear reaction is called the parent nuclei. And the product is called the daughter nuclide. Couldn't tell you why. They don't just go with reactant and product, but that's that's a term that's used. So um, the second type of, uh, that we looked at was beta particles, which is basically an electron flying out of the nucleus, right? And it was that converted a neutron into a proton. 
And so if you look at Uh, if you look at these reactions here, we wind up with one more proton than we started with. The positron emission was the exact opposite. You wind up with one fewer proton than you started with, because you can think of it kind of like the positive charge left the proton. And what's left behind after that is the neutron. Um, and then the last type is the electron capture. Like when that's literally just like you embed an electron into the nucleus and it cancels out the positive charge on the proton. Um, this is where we started getting into some math that we could actually do here. We started using E equals MC squared, right? Except in chemistry terms, if we're talking about the actual reaction, we wrote it like this, because we have a change in mass happening before and after. That change in mass, if we put it in in kilograms times the speed of light squared, is going to give us units of joules. So the only tricky thing about these really is it's products minus reactants. You just sum up the mass of all the products minus the mass of all the reactants. Um, the biggest trick is that the mass is usually given in AMU or in grams per mole. And in order for this equation to work properly and give us real, uh, give us standard units of, of um, energy, it needs to be in kilograms. So don't forget when you're get finding your delta M to put it in kilograms per mole, not grams per mole. Um, and in this case, this reaction is done for us. This is actually one, one of the reactions involved in, um, in a nuclear nuclear bomb going off, an early nuclear bomb, something like the, the first bomb dropped on Hiroshima. Um, uranium-235 is bombarded with a neutron. And that neutron um, basically makes that nucleus even less stable than it already was. Uranium-235 is already unstable, but it decays really, really slowly normally. If you hit it with a neutron, you turn it into uranium-236, which splits apart almost instantly. Uranium-236 splits apart into barium-140 and krypton-93, and three more neutrons. So still the same number of nuclei, of, uh, nucleons, still the same number of, of total protons plus neutrons on both sides, but there's a difference in the mass. The mass on the reactant side is 236.05 AMU, and the products is 235.867 AMU. That change in mass is what we're going to plug in right here. And C is always the same number, and it's on your conversion sheet. All right, so delta M in this case is just final minus initial. So we get 235.867. Seven six grams per mole minus two thirty six zero five two five eight What do we get for a number here? Point zero one nine. Negative, thank you. Can we have a negative number? Does that make sense? When we plug this in, that's going to give us a negative energy. Is that a problem? What does that mean? It's exothermic, basically. We're not calling this delta H. This is delta E because it's not really being the energy in chemical bonds. It's the energy in the nucleus that's changing. But for all intents and purposes, you can think of it like just like enthalpy. So it just means this is going to be exothermic. What one of the things that's really interesting here is if this reaction produces more neutrons, 
what are those neutrons going to do? If this is happening inside a big ball of uranium-235, those neutrons are going to fly around and they're going to hit something else. And if they hit another uranium-235 atom and stick, you get the whole process happening over again. So you get a chain reaction. Now we'll also call it a, a uh, autocatalytic reaction where the reaction causes itself to happen faster and faster and faster. Which if you do this in a nuclear reactor, that's called a meltdown. If you do this and weaponize it, you get a nuclear bomb. Basically, has anybody heard the term critical mass? Critical mass actually came, was originally a physics term that, um, that they developed in the Manhattan Project because critical mass was basically how much uranium you needed to gather in one place for the reaction to cause a runaway chain reaction. If you get, keep a mass below a certain mass, then more of these neutrons escape than get caught. And they just fired off into the surroundings as, as um, radioactive particles and cause tissue damage if people are around, but it won't cause an explosion. But if you get above critical mass, then more more neutrons are being captured by the other surrounding uranium um, atoms than are escaping, and you wind up with the reaction speeding up and getting faster and faster and faster until it explodes. All right, let's finish up this mathematical part here. We want to know the change in energy based on this. We're just going to plug that in, 0 0.1852 grams per mole times, except what do we need to do first? Kilograms, so divide by a thousand, right? The negative 1.852 times 10 to the minus four kilograms per mole. And speed of light is 3.0. Since we have four sig figs here, might as well use a better value for C. 2.998, if memory serves, times 10 to the eight uh, meters per second, which we're gonna square. And what do we get for an answer? The speed of light squared is going to be really close to 9 times 10 to the 16. So something like, this should be something times 10 to the 13, I think. What do we get? That's a pretty big number. Even if you put it in kilojoules, it's still 10 to the 10. So again, 10 to the 10 is, we're talking about 17 billion kilojoules per mole. Burning an equivalent amount of gasoline or sugar or anything else where we're talking about standard reactions happening, non-nuclear reactions, a big delta H is in the like 1,000 kilojoules per mole range. Um, this, is, this is why, one, this math, and then figuring out that this math happened is why um, in, uh, they reference it in Oppenheimer at one point, they talk about um, the letter that Einstein wrote to Roosevelt to get the Manhattan Project started, basically a all of a bunch of the physicists that were working with the allies all wrote a letter together saying, Hey, we've run these numbers and it's possible to make a bomb out of this stuff. And these, it would be an absurd amount of energy. So we need to get on top of that. Because the definition of a joule is a kilogram times a meter squared over a second squared. It's a weird unit, but the original 
the classical physics definition of, of kinetic energy is one half mass times velocity squared. And you put it all in standard units physics, which is kilograms and meters per second. And then they just said that the unit that comes out of that, they just redefined it as a joule. Logan? Yeah, this is one of the, historically, this is a really important one because it's the one that was used in, in um, that was used first. Um, but plutonium goes through a similar process. It has to get a little bit trickier. Um, thermonuclear weapons are actually fusion reactions. And we'll run the numbers for that in a second. But fusion reactions actually use nuclear weapons in order to, or basically they use nuclear bombs to start a fusion reaction. So you use traditional, or the, the first nuclear weapons used conventional explosives to start this process to compact it to the point that you got above critical mass. And then, um, and then you would have a nuclear explosion. If you take that nuclear explosion and use it to compact um, I believe they used lithium and deuterium, or is the first thermonuclear weapons. Um, then you get a fusion reaction happening. Yes, um, and actually that's a good point. I took out that, or we skipped over that slide. Um, let me open up the slides from It's not as, it doesn't produce as much energy, but it still goes through a similar process. And we can run the numbers on that too. Um, but there's basically, there's what's called a decay series. So a lot of times the product of one of these nuclear reactions is itself radioactive and will go through similar processes with different numbers, basically. And um, they call that a decay series. So, if you're, for instance, if you start with uranium-238, when it goes through an alpha decay, it'll make thorium-234. Thorium-234 will then go through two beta decays to turn back into uranium, which goes through another alpha decay and an alpha decay and an alpha decay. And so this whole series has one has an overall net reaction that means that eventually uranium-238 ends up as lead, I think it's 208. Um, but all of these processes are all downhill in energy. They're all going to be giving off energy, maybe not quite as much as this, um, because this is a, there's a reason that they chose to weaponize this particular reaction. It was, it was pretty intense even by nuclear reaction standards, and it happened fast. These ones happen really, really slowly, and we'll talk about rate today too. Um, but basically, this overall process, going from lead or uh, uranium-238 to lead-206, happens on the time scale of billions of years. Um, for half of the uranium, the half-life of uranium-238 decaying all the way to lead-206 is about, I think it's 4 billion years or 4.5 billion years. Um, by hitting it with an extra neutron, you just speed things up. Fusion bombs, then block cleaner, then fission bombs as far as nuclear radiation. It would be if we didn't have to use a fission bomb to get them started. But yes, it's still going to cause some fallout in the near, nearby areas, um, although less than than a traditional nuclear bomb. A fission bomb is is far worse um, than a fusion bomb. And if we could get fusion reactions to happen cleanly and sustainably in a power plant, then that if we're not using nuclear weapons to start that process, then in theory, it shouldn't make anything that's really very dangerous. You're making mostly stuff that's naturally occurring in nature. If we can get that to work. So let's talk about fusion. Here's a sample. This is not the version that was used in the earliest thermonuclear um, weapons. Uh, but if you take Hydrogen 2, also called deuterium, and hydrogen 3, which uh, has a common name of tritium from the prefix tri. You take in 
if you take deuterium and tritium and cause them cause them to go through a fusion reaction, you can make helium four and one extra neutron. How much energy is this going to be give us per mole? So I'll give you a head start. Fun fact, does anybody remember the old, I guess this is more maybe more topical, the first movie where Alfred Molina played Dr. Octopus, the, the one of the, I think that was Spider-Man 2, with Tobey Maguire back in like 2002 or so, came out while I was in high school. Um, the actual isot or the um, material that he was looking for to create his fusion reaction in that movie um, was tritium. It's a real thing and you actually do use it to create fusion. So... That's probably the last time a Marvel movie got anywhere close to scientific accuracy um, was the fact that he was looking for, used the right name for his fusion fuel. I think I was in chemistry when that happened and my chemistry teacher was excited about that. That's why I remember it. Is there really anything tricky about these when it comes to finding delta M? Not really. Products minus reactants. So helium four is four point zero zero two six, and one neutron is one one point zero zero eight seven. Reactants were tritium and deuterium. So three. Point zero one one six oh minus or plus two point oh one four one. That's going to give us a number in grams per mole. Again, it's going to be negative, right? What do we get? I don't think it's it's not as big of a number as the, the fission reaction. Which is one point eight negative one point eight eight times ten to the minus five kilograms per mole. So delta E is negative 1.88 times 10 to the minus five kilograms per mole times 2.998 meters per second squared. What do we get? So it's about a factor of 10 times less in terms of joules per mole. Why would a thermonuclear weapon be, be a bigger explosion than a regular nuclear weapon then? And why is that? It's more it's more abundant we can get deuterium just from from ocean water you can get deuterium and if you hit deuterium with neutrons you make tritium uh it's still hard to get it to be um you still have to put a whole bunch of energy in to do that but you can put a whole bunch of energy in to refine the tritium slowly and then release it all at once the other thing is that this was for this is for joules per mole of reaction right the, molecule, the weight of one mole of reactant is only about five grams. The weight for one mole of uranium is about 238 grams, right? 230, 236 if you count the neutron on the last example. 
So yeah, we, we have about a factor of 50 times less mass, but we only are decreasing our total amount of energy released by a factor of 10. So for the same weight, you can get more energy out. You get about five times more energy out. Even though the energy per mole is actually a little bit less. And since weight is actually what dictates how big of a bomb you can make, since you need a plane big enough to carry it or an ICBM big enough to carry it, um, that actually was the, the deciding factor. Plus, you get less nuclear fallout less radiation um, after the reaction itself. All right. One last random application. Which I don't think I need to keep it in here. Talk about rates here in a second. This, I'll go back. I broke it. There it goes. Um, there is a link in the PDF. Uh, the, uh, the name of the website makes me second guess it a little bit, um, but this is actually a, uh, they run the map basically, where they, you can take oh. a map and put a uh, nuclear explosion. You can pick the size of the bomb and see what it would look like. Um, so you could, it's unlikely that South Lake Tahoe would ever be a, a target of, of you know national importance, um, but Reno might be. Oh, there's no reason to get that specific. <laughs> Um, because if we go, so if we look at the the very first one, it will destroy just downtown Reno, right? But that's only 15 kilotons. That's only the equivalent of 15,000 tons of TNT. The biggest one ever detonated is called Tsar Bomba. And this one we will want to zoom out a bit. So everybody. We're still safe-ish. Um, that is that's the fireball radius. Is about is about no sorry that's the inside um, yellow one. The thermal radiation radius, which means third degree burns, just by being outside, goes almost goes. You know, you know, almost all the way to Zephyr Cove. Um, and this is this is the largest one ever detonated. They actually built one that was about twice as big. Oh. Um, and that one, that one gets all the way to Fallon and South Lake Tahoe. I mean, that's so Fallon. And when that outermost great ring is like glass mm -hmm. damage, which means broken windows. Broken windows all the way out to Fallon from Reno. So, would like no, probably not. No, it's, these are, no. there's a reason they're known as weapons of mass destruction. There's really like, there's three categories, weapons that get classified as weapons of mass destruction in their nuclear, biological and chemical. Um, and really chemical war, Warfare is really shouldn't even be in the same category because bio, biological warfare could wipe out the entire planet, and you know one bomb that can take out in you know that many square miles of people is a whole different category than you know mustard gas. Mustard gas is bad. Don't get me wrong, it's still a war crime, um, but it's not at the same category as biological weapons or or uh, nuclear weapons. Tosh. No, because it's it's still a negative value. It's it's um basically it's giving off a billion kilojoules per mole instead of a ten billion kilojoules per mole. Sam. But how far 
would be because doesn't like radiation affect even outside of that range? Right. This is just the initial blast. This doesn't count fallout and, and radiation poisoning and things like that. Um, this the thermal radiation is a um, it that's the ring where you're likely to get third degree burns. Um, but you still, if you were indoors and so protected from the blast and still in that area, you could still be subject to radiation poisoning down the road, depending on what kind of what kind of nuclear fallout there was. Um, and this is really just, it doesn't take into account the geography. This is just a really rough idea because they, this doesn't take into account that South Lake Tahoe is in inside of a basin that might be slightly protected. There might be like a shadow um, where the mountains protected certain areas differently. So this is really just a really rough idea, but just to give you an idea of just how wildly different nuclear weapons are than traditional weapons. And there's a reason why after World War II, they were never used again in military applications uh, because it's basically the, I used to quote Robert Downey Jr. as Iron Man, the best, is, the best weapon is a weapon you only need to use once. Um, that's basically what the U.S. did with Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So it basically set the precedent that we have these and that's not, don't give us a use, reason to use them. I don't think so. Um, you could probably Google around a little bit and find something similar that would look at that. But it, that's really going to be heavily dependent on the type of bomb, too. And so you'd have to find somebody who did similar programming, but the different right? types and the wind. Yeah. Have you so I don't think we're going to get a whole lot of time to talk about the biological effects, um, but just in general, you can wind up um, different levels of radiation poisoning can um, can basically like destroy your organs to the point where you're still walking around and living temporarily, but you but you're just waiting for your current round of cells to die. Um, so they call that that's that's where the term walking dead actually comes from is radiation poisoning because you can actually have like okay I got exposed to this much radiation I will die in 14 to 17 days um, but you have 14 to 17 days where you're still conscious and awake and talking maybe even walking around um, but it's just you your immune system and several other the systems in your body get that got get bombarded the hardest will just shut down and you just die pretty quickly after that. That's an interesting idea. Um, I'm kind of curious myself. There's Tokyo. Um, I mean, when we're talking, Japan is, Japan is roughly the size of California. Um, and so it's still not going to take all of Japan, but that's a pretty sizable portion. You can see that. Yeah, I don't know if we need to get that morbid yeah, right now. Um, so that's, I'll leave that for you to do in your spare time. Um, the link is on here if you want to look at it. The point, I think, has been made that these are a whole different category. Just if you're going down the rabbit hole, you might want to look. There's a video, I think I've showed some of my Chem 1 classes about how the US did uh, all this nuclear testing and Kodak figured out about it because it was exposing their film. And so the the government had this secret relationship with Kodak. They tell them when they're going to do their, their testing, but they were exposing the rest of the East Coast because the wind would blow all the radiation over. East Coast, which cost people a lot of cancer and stuff. But Kodak knew when to stop making their film. So kind of an interesting thing about how the government works with the, with the film company to protect the film company, but not the average American. So Remember how, how Becquerel discovered radioactivity because of that x-ray plate? Basically, the, the film in black and white cancer, or in black and white cameras was, was being ruined. Whose hand was going up a second ago? Did I see one? No? It is. All right. So last, last new new topic that will be on the test. 
um, is we're going to talk about the timing of all this, you know, the rates. Um, so this class, we're not going to go into rates in too much detail, but I think it's worth talking about where this math comes from. So that it's not just a black box that you're plugging numbers into with no idea of what's going on. Um, basically chemical rates, a chemical rate is always just basically how much change has occurred um, over a set amount of time. So that's it. So the definition of a chemical rate is a change in concentration per change in time. So it's kind of like an ice table, except we're bringing time units into it as well. Um, and really, we can write the rate of a reaction based on, on any of the reactants or products. So if we look at the reaction rate of, of product formation, it's always going to be a positive number because you're always making your product. Um, there, if we look at it in, in terms of units of the reactants, we're losing reactants as time goes on. And the rates are kind of interesting. Um, and I'm, this is a lot of this is background for my my gen chem class that we go to in more detail because we look at more types of reactions than, um, with rates. Um, but one of the things that's really interesting is if you actually look at concentration versus time. So this is for the reaction of hydrogen gas with iodine reacting to make hyd uh, hydroiodic acid. If you look at the concentrations versus time, it's not a straight line. In other words, the rate is not constant. As the reaction progresses, the rate actually slows down. And we also think of the rate as being the slope of the line. So for those of you in, who have had calculus, it's basically the derivative of concentration versus time. And so you can see that, that initially, the slope is really steep, right? And then as the reaction progresses, it gets slower and slower and slower to the point where eventually it winds up flattening out entirely and you've reached equilibrium where the, react, the forward reaction is happening at the same rate as the backward reaction. So why would that be the case? Why might that change? What has to happen for this chemical reaction to happen? We, we do say that the rate is decaying as the rate drops off. Loss of mass. Yeah. Yeah, as we need these reactions in order for this reaction to happen, you have to have hydrogen bump into iodine. If you have less hydrogen around, the reaction can't happen as fast. So as you use up your reactant, it gets harder and harder for the reaction to keep going, which slows things down. Um, So all of this, I'm going to skip some of these slides, basically say that when we look at individual chemical reactions, we wind up being able to, to predict what the rate is of a reaction as a function of concentrations. So we can say that a rate of any chemical reaction is equal to some constant times these concentrations because you need these molecules to run into each other. If you decrease the concentration of one of your reactants, you're going to slow the reaction down because you have fewer things for it to run into. Um, you can think of the logic for it in terms of um, fender benders in cars. Let's say that um, what are the does the odds of a of a car getting rear ended go up or down on the weekends when the tourists are in town? Up, right? More cars on the roads means there's a higher probability somebody rear ends somebody, right? If there's exactly one car driving around the roads of South Lake Tahoe, what are the odds that it's going to get in, into a fender bender with another car? Zero. That's only one car, right? You can't rear end another car if there's no car to rear end. So in that, that same logic applies to chemical rates. You need them to run into each other, and the more you have of them, the faster that'll happen. Um, this is the, uh, the derivation of how we get this next equation. Uh, but basically, this is the part that we're going to use the most for this class. 
is if we actually look at that function, if I go all the way back to this graph here, what is this shape of this graph? What type of function does that look like? It looks like an exponential decay, right? Which kind of makes sense because as you start losing reactant, it slows down, flattens out more and more and more, right? So it kind of makes sense that the next equation, if we want to um, actually get an equation for concentration versus time, concentration as a function of time, we get for a first order reaction, which is all we're gonna be dealing with with this case, all naturally occurring radioactive reactions are first order. We get this equation. And all this is really saying is if we know an initial amount and we know a certain constant that we use lowercase k, not uppercase k, because uppercase k is what? Equilibrium, right? Somebody said it. Uppercase k is an equilibrium constant. This is called a rate constant. But this means that we can calculate how much of a of a particular element is left or a particular compound is left as a function of time, as long as we know how much we started with and we know what k is. It also means we can work the other way and say, okay, well, if we know what this ratio is and we know what k is, we can figure out how much time has passed. So there's a couple ways that this works, but the most, um, one of the, the ways that's most applicable to the um, lots of different areas is radiometric dating. Radiometric dating, so carbon dating or, or using um, uranium lead dating works because if we know what K is for a particular radioactive reaction and we know what this value was, A naught was, we can measure how much is still around to figure out T. If we solve for T, So here's an example. This also comes back to, I guess I should define this other term first. Um, if anybody's heard the term half-life, the half-life of a reaction uh, is basically how long does it take to get to half of what you started with? And for a first order reaction, because we get this ratio inside based on laws of logs, um, a first order reaction like radioactive reactions have a constant half-life. It doesn't matter how much you started with. The time to get to half of what you started with is the same. Do you have a question, Mark? Okay. So in the way we see this is we see things like the half-life for carbon-14 is 5.73 times 10 to the three years. If you started with 0 0.110 grams of carbon-14, how much would be left after 11,000 years? Well, for starters, if we know what the half-life is, we can get the rate constant. Because what's true about this ratio at the half-life? Close. The half-life is what? At the half-life, this number is half of what you started with. So this ratio just simplifies out to be 0.5, right? Because you could say, okay, well, ln of, again, at the half-life, we have half of what we started with, right? If we have half of what we started with, in this ratio, we can simplify that, can't we? Just a reminder that the blood drive is calm. So remember to eat well for food, drink water, and bring your clean IV to the checkout table on food immediately. Thank you. I'll excuse that one, but not the first two. So if we're at the half life, it doesn't actually matter how much 
a naught was, it doesn't matter how many grams we started with, we have half of it left. And the units wind up canceling each other out. So we just get natural log of 0.5 equals negative K times, we usually write half-life as T subscript one half. Um, although, I don't know, do people still play half-life? Um, lambda shows up. Lambda is uh, wavelength, but in nuclear chemistry, lambda is uh, actually the symbol for half-life as well, um, which in the original half-life game, you followed the lambda symbol. You're going to the lambda complex through the whole game. I remember that one really well. I played that one in high school for lots and lots of hours. Um, this is a little bit more descriptive, though, so we can remember what's going on and we're not confusing it with wavelength because lambda is also the symbol for wavelength. All right, so if we know this, all we have to do to get the rate constant is plug in our half-life here. Natural log of 0.5 equals negative K times the half-life. And we have a value for the half-life. So that just allow, is gonna allow us to say, so uh, LN of 0.5, it comes out to, to 619 or 691. 692. So negative, negative 0.692 equals negative K times 5,730 years. Because that's 5.73 times 10 to the three is 5,730, right? So I just converted it because it was I didn't leave myself enough room to write it in scientific notation. Which means we can get a value for K. K is just going to be, um, this is basically another form of that equation at the top left. Both of these come from the same initial reaction, or same initial equation. What do we get for K? Positive number, which is good. K should always be positive. What do we get? Something times 10 to the minus four. What are our units on K? These we had grams over grams, so those canceled out, and then we took the log of it anyway. So this would, so this had no units. We had five thousand seven hundred and thirty years. We divided both sides by years. So our units on K are one over years. What? What's up? Sorry. That's natural log of 0.5. Sorry, that sounded really harsh. I really, I didn't mean what like that. I mean, what's going on? <laughs> um, so what does this mean? What does this unit mean? It basically means if you've got one atom of carbon 14, in one year, there's a 0 0.0001 chance that it's going to decay in that year. So it's basically how many disintegrations do you get per year? Particle physicists and nuclear chemists get to use all the best vocabulary. They don't have um, you know, reactants, they have parent nuclides and they don't have um, reactions, they have disintegrations. They don't add a reactant, they bombard it with a neutron. All right, so if we know what K is, if we had a set amount of carbon-14 initially, 
and then we we put it in a box and we came back 11,000 years later how much carbon 14 would be left we know k we know t we know a not because this is um, because the form of this equation has this ratio, it actually doesn't really matter what units we use for molarity or for uh, concentration. We can use anything that's proportional to molarity. So we can just use, if we're talking about grams of carbon-14, as long as it's grams of carbon-14 on top and grams of carbon-14 on bottom, this, this um, still works. So we just need to be consistent with our units, but it doesn't really matter what they are when we're talking about um, concentration here. So with that in mind, we know we can just use 0 0.110 grams of carbon-14 here, and we're just gonna solve for this. So if we plug it all in, natural log of A over 0 0.110 grams equals minus 1.21 10 to the fourth, and then our time is 1.12 times 10 to the fourth, this is 10 to the negative fourth, sorry. How do we know, know what time units to use? We could have done this in minutes if we wanted to, right? But how do, how do I know to use years here? Because it says years, but I could be tricky and say days. You might be surprised. Some of those more exotic isotopes, they have half-lives that are measured in minutes or even seconds. It comes from the units on the half-life. The half-life was in units of years, which means K was in units of one over years which tells us as long as we're using this value of K, we need to use our time is gonna be in the same units as our K value. If we did our K calculation and we wound up with K in units of seconds or minutes or days or billions of years, then we're gonna use the same unit on our time here. Logan? So it's, it's a little bit like any other slow reaction. Like what does iron look like when it's rusting? You don't really know what it looks like when it's rusting. You just know like, oh, some of it's rusted and some of it's not, but it's happening slow enough that you're not really saying it's, you are always watching it happen, but it's easiest to say, well, this is what it looks like now. And this is what it looked like before. So basically it depends on the reaction. The carbon 14 decays into nitrogen 14. So it just looks like you have nitrogen after that. What do we get for our answer here? We're just gonna multiply these together. How do we undo natural log? E to the power of both sides, right? And then we're gonna just get A over one or point one one zero. What happens to our units here now? One over years and years, cancel. It's gonna be really close to the canceling out, right? Should get something close to 0.25, I think. After we do e to the power.
this is a good one to practice on because there is a nuclear decay question on the final, on the practice test, right? I think it's question 10. As you do this same problem, I'll give you a half-life. You tell me how much of a product is left or how much time has elapsed. What'd you say, Scott? 0.258. So we have 0 0.258 equals A over our A naught, which was 0 0.110 grams. So our um, final amount of A is something like 0 0.026 grams. So this same idea is, is how radiometric dating works. If you know what half-life is, and you know the initial amount and the current amount, you could solve for T. Right, so it's it all comes back to once you have this equation, plug in what you know, solve for what you don't. It's just a plug and chug once you know the basic principles. So it's always going to be concentration of A over concentration of A naught equals minus KT. And A and A naught are just your amounts of your radioactive substance. And with that, that's everything that's going to be on the test. Wow. That's all the new material. We have three minutes to spare. No, we have like eight minutes to spare. I'm so ahead of schedule. All right, let's do one more practice then. We have eight minutes. No? All right, how about this? I'm okay saving this one for Friday because I have to talk to you about something on Friday. I don't have to. We'll start with this one on Friday. You've got to review it at some point between now and then. This is problem number, is, is it nine or 10 that's on the final exam? Is all, not this exactly, but on the practice test, there's a nuclear dating question that's just like this using this equation where you're given enough information to solve it. So give that a try and we'll go over it on Friday. All right. And break. Tosh. Yes. So A and A naught are just con their concentrations or amounts of any nuclear material, anything that's going to go through a radioactive reaction, or really any first order reaction. We're just we're only applying it to nuclear reactions right now. This is just natural log. K is called the rate constant. And it's going to always have units that are like one over time. And then T is time. No problem.